without further ado, I'll just go ahead and introduce our opening keynote speaker. Um, and it's a really special privilege of mine to introduce uh, Dr. Corin, as he's a, uh, not only a former uh, colleague and, and collaborator of mine, uh, close friend, and very glad he could come and, and, and spend the day with us today. Um, but now to get into some of the uh, just more specific details um, and his accomplishments. Um, so Dr. Ser Sergey Corin is an associate investigator at the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. He, uh, uh, again, an associate investigator in the genome informatics section, computational and statistical genomics branch, and, and at the Human Genome Research Institute. After completing his master's, uh, Dr. Corrin joined the J. Craig Venter Institute as a bioinformatics engineer under the supervision of Dr. Granger Sutton. During his three years at JCVI, he contributed to the development of Celera Assembler, which was used to assemble the first human genome. And in parallel, Dr. Corrin worked under the supervision of Dr. Mihai Pop at the University of Maryland College Park, where he ventured into a topic that's near and dear to me, metagenome assembly and analysis. And that's uh, where uh, Sergey and I had a good fortune of working together on some uh, metagenomic data analysis and, and software tools uh, back in the early 2000, 2010, 11, 12 timeframe. Um, afterwards, uh, in 2010, Dr. Corn uh, joined the National Biodefense and uh, Analysis and Countermeasure Center, where he led a genome assembly development and pioneered the use of single molecule se sequencing for the reconstruction of complete genomes. And this is, again, just keep in mind, everyone, this is really early days. We're talking 2010. And this is right when PacBio is kind of getting announced, and it's really exciting to have him here today to talk, <coughs> talk about his journey and, and all of the great tools that he's developed. Um, and then in 2015, uh, Dr. Corrin joined NHGRI as a founding member of the Genome Informatics Session, and, and numerous accomplishments um, and, and, and seminal publications that I'm not going to list all of those all out, but again, uh, just please join me in welcoming Dr. Corrin for his keynote presentation uh, today at RAD. Thank you, Sergey. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, Todd. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, hopefully, I can be as exciting as the Astros. Uh, so the main topic I want to talk about today is uh, a, the recently completed human genome, and kind of I want to give you a retrospective of why did it take so long to finish it, um, how did we manage to do it now, uh, and kind of what comes next? What do we do now that we finished it, right? Um, and because we finished the human genome last year, I don't want to talk about old things. I'm actually going to also present the next uh, complete human genome, which is a complete diploid human genome, um, which we're just announcing today that it will be available. Um, so you, as you may have heard, um, the Telomere Telomere Consortium, which I am a part of, uh, finished the human genome and published this in science um, this year. Uh, there was about 10 percent that was left after the human genome project wrapped it up, so about 20 years ago. Um, and we were able to solve it with a combination of two long-read sequencing technologies, right? Um, and, you know, kind of the question is like, well, first, why do we care? You know, the Human Genome Project did a great job. It was a monumental effort, and, you know, it produced an extremely well-curated, extremely accurate representation that's been in use in the clinical space, um, in the genomic space for 20 years, right? So why do we care? Do we really care about that 10 percent, right? Um, and I would argue, yes, we do. Um, there are essential cell functions that are left out in that 10 percent. The 10 percent that we're missing includes things like the centromeric regions, which are key to cell division and, and chromosome segregation, right? Um, there were a lot of segmental duplications, ampliconic gene families, um, and then things like the RDNA arrays, which again are, these are all fundamental cellular processes, uh, and without having a good representation of them, it's hard to say exactly how the bodies function, how the cells function. Uh, we can't study that. We can't study how those affect disease if we don't see them, right? Um, and a lot of these duplications that are missing, the reason they're uh, more difficult to resolve, and I'll get into a little bit more detail as I go forward, is because they're very recent. And we care about things that are very recent because they probably happened in the human lineage and differentiate us from the other primates, right? So these are some of the regions that make us human, um, and they're specific to humans and we don't see them. So again, we can't study, A, what makes humans different from the other primates, but also how that affects human health and disease uh, in the human population. So 
you know, I'd argue, like I said, this is relevant to all of genomics and we've been uh, fooling ourselves for 20 years by ignoring these regions and essentially closing our eyes uh, when we do all these kinds of analysis using the current reference before this was finished. So obviously your next question is like, well, why didn't we do this before? Why did it take 20 years, right? What have we been doing for the past 20 years? Um, and so this is a cartoon uh, circa about 2000. Actually, I think its origin is that it was making fun of the strategy Solera was using to try to resolve the, the genome, that it was impossible that, you know, you take the genome, um, you cut it up into tiny, tiny pieces, you take this pile of pieces, and then you try to put it back together into the complete human genome. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's a very hard puzzle. There's billions and billions of pieces of, of short sequencing reads. Um, in the time they were using Sanger reads, a little longer, but still relatively short. Um, and so you can imagine when there are things that are repetitive in the, in the DNA, that the sky pieces in a, in a big puzzle, you know, it's hard to know where they go. So we kind of left that 8%, the sky part of the puzzle, we just left it in the box and said like, okay, we can't do that, anything with that, we'll just, you know, worry about that, don't worry about that, it's not that important, it's just the sky. Um, and like I said, obviously, you know, sky is kind of important. If we didn't have a sky, it would be a problem. Um, so what enabled us to do this now? Well, we've been fortunate, like Todd alluded to in his introduction, uh, to work in this new era of sequencing um, and the era of long-read sequencing. So there's two primary long-read technologies right now. Uh, one is nanopore ultra-long sequencing. Um, this is a really cool instrument. Uh, the picture here shows our collaborator sequencing in his hotel room at a conference. Um, so he did the library prep in the coffee maker. Um, you know, you can like use the hot water to do the PCR reaction uh, and then prep it and the instrument fits in the palm of your hand. Um, and that's because kind of uniquely, it's not an optics-based instrument, uh, it's electric-based. So you have these pores that you can see in the diagram here that are embedded in the membrane. There's a current that passes through them. And then as the DNA molecule moves through, uh, it changes how much current can get through, right? Because it's blocking part of the pore. And so then you get these kinds of traces that they call a squiggle. And then you use machine learning algorithms to translate those squiggles into ACGs and Ts. And it's pretty amazing that this actually works. Uh, you can actually read extremely long pieces of DNA, um, hundreds of thousands of bases at a time. Uh, the longest records are over a megabase. Um, Obviously, because you're reading a single molecule strand, the accuracy is not as high as what you may have been used to from the Illumina sequencing instruments. That's 95% or so, though it's always improving, always changing as they use more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, as they get a better understanding of what kind of features of the DNA impact the current, right? For example, methylation doesn't affect it differently than non-methylated bases, things like this. The more you learn, the more you see, the better your models get. Um, and so they've recently even demonstrated that they can get reads that are over 99% accuracy uh, in some contexts. Um, so the pros of this, like I said, is it's extremely uh, high length. It's very high throughput because these instruments are tiny. Uh, you can run a lot of them in parallel, uh, but there's a relatively lower base uh, quality here. Um, and then the other big long read sequencing technology is PacBio. Uh, PacBio uh, in the early days used to produce similar to, uh, data to the ONT. It was higher noise. Um, maybe 90% accuracy, uh, and similar, you know, it was not quite as long, it was in the 40, 50 KB range. But then in the last couple of years, they refocused, and they focused on this, what they call hi-fi uh, reads. And the way this works is uh, all PacBio libraries get these kind of bell adapters that are shown in blue in the image here. Uh, and so the polymerase uh, start sequencing along, uh, and you go around, and because this is a circular template, you keep going around and around. And so if you can keep your polymerase from falling off this template, you can go around the same thing multiple times. So you keep seeing the same DNA in the forward strand and in the reverse strand and the forward strand and the reverse strand. Uh, and then even though each time you view it, you make mistakes because you mis make random mistakes and they're in different places when you put those all on top of each other and make one single version of that molecule that you've been sequencing this whole time, you get an extremely accurate read. Um, the accuracy is over 99.9% uh, quality uh, for each individual sequence. So compare that to you know, 95% that you would get from an ONT read. Um, and so these reads give you near perfect accuracy. But because you have to read each template, you have to have this short enough that your polymerase can read it multiple times. It's really limited to about 20, 25 kilobases. It's, there's not that much headroom to keep getting. You can't get 100 KB because you just can't read 100,000 bases 10 times to get this high accuracy 
from it, right? Um, so, you know, why do these two technologies are kind of complementary? And like, I want to give you an intuition of how we use this in genome assembly to resolve um, the repeats. So the first one is kind of intuitive. Uh, it's, you know, if we have a read that's long enough, nothing, anything that's shorter than that read is not repetitive to us, right? So here's a toy genome. It has a two copy repeat. One copy has these two variants specific to it that are shown in red here. And so when we start sequencing, these are drawn as reads. They have uh, the little dots indicate errors in the read, so they're not perfect. They have some errors um, when we read them. So if we read all these reads, uh, we can reconstruct this genome correctly, even though we never actually see the specific read with a variance, right? Because the reads are too noisy for us to show that single difference between the two repeat copies. We know we can walk the genome correctly through the purple path because the, you know, the end here of this genome, of this bit has to go over here because this sequence over here is unique, right? We can't connect. This bit is going to look different than this bit over here, right? Um, and so that's very intuitive. It's a simple idea that if anything is shorter than your reads, it's not repetitive in your genome. Uh, and that's easy to understand. And so the nanopore reads help you resolve these, these repeats in this way. But there's another way to resolve these repeats, and that's by using the fact that this repeat is not exactly identical. It has these two differences that I showed here. And so now when we sequence hi-fi reads, they're never as long. None of them are longer than this repeat, but we can still correctly reconstruct this genome because now the reads are accurate enough that when we see these differences in the reads, we can be quite confident that you know, this red base change is not a sequencing error, but it's an actual genomic difference. And so this read over here uh, can't possibly connect to the read over here because it, this one doesn't have the red bit and this one does, right? Um, and so you can imagine accuracy is really important here because we want to be sure when we see a difference in a read, you know, when we compare this read to this read over here and we see one difference, we want to be sure that difference is actually a genomic difference, a real difference in the genome, and not just sequencing noise. So the more accurate we can make these reads, the better we can do this. So we uh, combine this data to get the best of both worlds. Um, the way we integrate this is we start with the HiFi data first because it's the high accuracy one. Um, we do a couple of tricks to clean up the data even more and get it even more accurate. One simple trick is homopolymer compression. Um, this is just taking any repeating base, single nucleotide base, and collapsing it down. Um, this is a common error mode of both ONT and PAC bio data that, you know, they'll tell you there's A's here, but they don't know if it's five or six A's, for example, right? Um, then we clean up the reads a little bit more. If we see that every read in a position says there's a C here and one read says, no, this is a T, we say you must have made a mistake here in the sequencing. This really should be a C. Um, and then we can build a graph for the assembly from very long, perfect overlaps. So whenever we see that sequences share some similarity, we connect them to each other in the graph. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in a second. Um, and so that gives us an extremely accurate representation of what is in the genome, what kind of repeats are in the genome that we couldn't resolve. Um, and then we put nanopore data on top of this uh, in order to correctly count, order, and orient these repeats. So you know, in the cases where the HiFi data is too short and the repeats are identical, like in that example I showed, we can still use the ONT data on top of that to resolve the things we couldn't. Right, so now I actually can give you some examples of what does this actually look like? What does it look like when we build the HiFi graph? So this is an assembly graph, so if you're not familiar, this is a sequence uh, on the nodes here. Uh, these edges indicate that there's similarity. So this is saying that the end of this node sequence shares some similarity with the beginning of this node. Uh, and the numbers here indicate coverage. Um, so if you look at this as a human, uh, the coverages are all, you know, at normal about 25, 20 coverage, which is what we expect. That's what we sequence this genome to. Uh, and so none of these look like noise. Uh, and so we expect that we should have used every node because if we don't use one of these nodes, that means we're skipping sequence in the genome, but we think that's real sequence in the genome, so we shouldn't be throwing out any sequence, right? Um, and so if you stare at this long enough, uh, there's actually only one way to traverse this and use every node. Um, so if you go this way, you can't traverse every node. You have to skip these two, right? Um, so the only way to traverse this is to go like this. Um, and uh, the ONT data can help guide you. But in this case, you could actually do that from HiFi data alone because 
this is a, is a unique traversal. There's no other way to use every node here, assuming you want to use them all once, right? And um, uh, you don't have to use every edge because remember the edges are just similarity. So by skipping this edge, I'm not skipping any sequence because the sequence that's covered by this edge is in this node and in this node as well, right? Because they share sequence already. Um, so that's an example where you don't need ONT data. There are examples where the ONT data uh, is necessary and there's no information in the HiFi data and they can be complex like the one here where there's, a, there's this branching structure so we don't know which way we need to go, right? This node needs to be used twice. You can see from the coverage because it's double everything else. Um, and so, but we don't know if we need to go this way first or this way first, right? And there's no information in the HiFi graph that will let you figure it out. The traversals are equally likely from all the data you've seen. Um, it can be even very simple, like this is a, hair, we call this a hairpin structure. Um, and the problem here is we don't know if we need to go this direction or this direction into this node on the top, right? And um, these are pretty, sim uh, pretty common in the human X chromosome for whatever reason um, and other uh, organisms we've seen. So with this, we can put the ONT data on top and the ONT data will tell us how to traverse these graphs, right? Um, so for the human genome that we finished, the, the first T to T genome, we did this manually, but manual analysis is time consuming, right? So you start with a graph like this, this is the full human genome, uh, and then you have to manually go through it and organize it to look like this. Um, so you've got, you know, we figured out which chromosome pieces are which. There's these regions which are marked with, uh, with these triangles, and there's a, a specific sequence context that the PagBi or HiFi reads don't seem to sequence. Um, so they end up with just no data there. Um, and so that means we have to re recognize that this is a piece of the same chromosome as this and put them together. Uh, you know, this happens a lot in some chromosomes like at the beginning of chromosome X, uh, but it does happen like one or two times on average for the chromosomes for the human genome. Um, and then for all these bits that are in gray, these are the uh, human uh, repeat arrays, whether these are alpha satellite like centromeres or human satellite one, two, three. Uh, and so you have to manually go in with ONT data and other manual analysis and untangle this big bit of uh, hair pin, like uh, messy spaghetti structure, right? Um, and also the uh, manual analysis is error prone. Humans are not so good at repetitive tasks, right? This is why we invented computers and other automata. Um, and so, you don't need to be familiar with the details of this, but I just want to show this as an example from a manual reconstruction. And so what we want to see is that all the data should be in this. Um, so this is a sequencing type that is strand specific. So we, if we reconstructed this genome correctly, all the data should be uh, here in the teal uh, color. Uh, and in the middle here, we see that there's one bit where it flips and it's on the wrong strand. So this means we've got a large inversion in the middle here where we've inverted a sequence uh, in the reconstruction. Um, and this is about an 800 kilobase region on chromosome Y, which is one of the more complex chromosomes. And the reason <laughs> it's flipped is because it's a large hairpin, unlike the one I showed you before, where there are just two nodes involved. Now there's a lot more. And you can see that this is, you know, becomes a combinatorial problem because there's all the possible ways to combine, whether you go through this node first, then this node, then this node, and then the combinatorial explosion, right, of every possible combination of these nodes along the way. And the reason this was a mistake in the manual process is because the human missed one of the traversals, which happened to be the correct one. So out of the choices a human had for picking which one is best, they actually never had the correct choice. So we couldn't have never reconstructed it correctly um, because you know it's easy to miss one when you're trying to work with all these possible combinations of nodes, right? Um, so we don't want to do this manually for the next genome. We want to take what we learned doing it once and make this routine and make it so that if I come into my doctor's office in two years, they can give me my entire genome uh, and not have to contact, call, you know, NIH and have like 10 people spend a, month, a year on this, right? Um, so we've taken what we learned from this genome project uh, and we've put it into a pipeline um, that we call Verco. It's our new assembler um, that's designed to do this automatically. Um, so the recipe is similar to what we use for um, the initial human uh, T2T genome. Uh, you get uh, hi-fi coverage, you get ultra-long ONT coverage, um, and then you can get uh, trio data from the parents or other data to get long-range information to reconstruct the haplotypes. So because most, because uh, humans are diploid, you want to reconstruct the maternally inherited part of the genome and the paternally inherited part of the genome. 
right? And so the way this works is very similar to what I just described to you that we did manually, where you take the reads, you homopolymer compress them. Uh, we also microsatellite compress them. Uh, you build this very high accuracy graph. Um, then we layer on the ultra long reads to resolve the repeats. Um, then we have these, you know, the way the graph looks is you have these uh, haplotype specific nodes, these uh, homozygous nodes which have to be duplicated. Uh, uh, and then you have some other repeat structures. Um, and then when we add in long range information like TRIO, we can say, okay, well, these look like they came from the mom. So we have to take a path like this through here where we duplicate these two nodes. And then this is the paternal path, right? And so this is all automated uh, by Virco and you just give it the data and it outputs the maternal and the paternal reconstruction um, at the end. So just to give you a sense of what kind of outputs it gets, so you get a separate output for each haplotype, uh, the maternal, which is colored red in these pictures, and the paternal blue. Um, and we use the graph structure to give accurate um, scaffold. So we use the graph structure even when we can't automatically resolve everything. We can still tell you that things are part of the same chromosome. Um, so there's, here's a simple example where we have a nice, well-behaved chromosome, and we can just take two paths through here, the blue, no, you know, the blue nodes with using this node uh, in the middle that's homozygous through, and then the red nodes, again, using the same homozygous node. So this gets output twice uh, as part of the sequence, but you get nice long sequences that resolve the entire chromosome as the mom uh, inherited from the mom and the dad. There may be some repeats that we still can't resolve, uh, even with the high fine OET data. Um, there are not too many, but you know, just there are a few. Uh, and so in this case, we still know this bit and this bit have to be connected because there's no other way to go across this. You know, we can't go out anywhere else in the genome. Uh, but, and we know these belong in the middle, but we can't order and orient them yet. Um, but we'll still tell you that this goes you know, before this. Um, so that's still useful information we can get, we can get from the graph. Um, and then uh, in some cases, like when I showed you, there's some sequencing contexts that make bio-hi-fi data not generate any reads. Uh, so there's a, a coverage gap here. Um, we can then use, you know, so this can be haplotype specific. Um, and we do try to patch it with ONT data, but sometimes we, we fail to do that. We don't uh, close every gap. Uh, and so in this case, if we have a gap in only the paternal haplotype but not the maternal, we can again infer that this must be connected to this and we're missing sequence here, right? And we can still tell you that these two go together. So when you run this on an actual human sample, this is uh, HGO2, it's a well-known uh, sample. It's used by Genome in a Bottle as kind of the benchmark standard uh, for sequencing technologies. Um, if you run this through our pipeline, this is what the graph looks like. And so just to give you kind of a quick tour, um, you know, most of the chromosomes, these are you know, chromosome one, two, three, four, five, right? These are, all the human chromosomes are essentially resolved. You can, you can walk the maternal path in them and the paternal path and get complete reconstructions without any issues. Um, you know, this is the X and Y. They look different than the others because obviously the, the, most of the X and most of the Y don't have homology to each other. This little bit here is the pseudo-autosomal region, the far region where they pair. So those have similarity. Um, but we can still resolve that with the trio information. And, Importantly, the Y chromosome, which was complicated and we had that mistake in before that I showed you in the picture, is automatically and correctly resolved by this pipeline. So it fixes that manual human mistake. Um, the most difficult remaining bit of the human genome, and this is true for all primates that we've looked at, um, is the uh, acrocentric. These are the ones that contain the human um, RDNA arrays, um, and which are very repetitive and very similar across all five of the chromosomes, um, they remain connected. So you can see that there's you know, one, two, three, four, five chromosomes coming into this big tangle. Um, so kind of the next step that's left for us to work on, and that's our next target for the assemblies, how can we automatically resolve this, um, at least to the level of finding out what the specific version of our DNA to each chromosome is uh, and pairing across that, right? So what this chromosome actually looks like is there's a long, relatively easy to resolve, resolve uh, long arm. Then it goes into this big, messy RDNA where it repeats the 50 kilobase RDNA repeat multiple times, um, hundreds of times uh, often. And then it has a little short piece that goes on the other end 
uh, of that array. And so there's two problems you have to solve here. One is we have to pair this little bit to the appropriate, you know, whether it goes with this or this or this or this or this. Um, and then there's also how do we represent the RDNA array in the middle. Um, and the way we did that for the manual finished human genome uh, was we identified chromosome-specific versions of the RDNA array and filled that in. Um, and so that was a very manual process. Uh, for this genome, we want to do that automatically, which is what we're working on for methods to do that. Uh, but even, you know, even barring that, when you run this through the pipeline, you get, you know, almost 30 of the 46 chromosome uh, in this uh, human sample as a single scaffold. 25 of them are as a grapless chromosome. So they're done, essentially, out of the sample. You don't have to do anything. Um, and so with a little bit of, you know, and this is just to give you context, this one blue node here uh, looks like this if you just look at the HiFi data alone. So you can see how much simplification we've eliminated from the process that the human would have had to do before um, that now is automatically handled for you by the uh, automated HiFi and ONT integration. Um, and so, you know, with a little bit of manual curation, much less for one person, you know, this is essentially like a week or two weeks of my time, um, you know, it, a lot less than we did for the original T2T project. We have um, a version of HGO2 that we're releasing um, as the complete sequence of, the, of a deployed human genome. Um, so CHM13 was the original one we did um, a couple of years ago that was published this year. Um, it, has, it had obviously 23 chromosomes because it's a, it's a haploid cell line. It's diploid, but the uh, haplotypes are near identical. So you can represent uh, each chromosome by just one copy. Here now we have an actual diploid genome. So we have 46 chromosomes uh, plus the mitochondria plus uh, EBV. This is uh, a virus that's there because the way the cell lines are immortalized is using EBV. So the virus is present in the samples. Um, so we, you know, when you sequence it, the genome, you reconstruct the human genome and the EBV virus as well. Um, we do still have the unplaced sequences that come from the RDNA arrays. We know there, there are RDNA arrays, but we can't place them on the specific chromosomes. Uh, but we have, you know, the full six gigabase human genome uh, with the nine, only nine gaps left, which correspond to the RDNA array. Uh, and this is now in the process of being validated uh, and released into the public. I mean. Um, so, you know, when we first did this and did the T2T genome, uh, we, there was a lot of new biology we could describe, uh, and there was a whole companion list of papers that I'm listing here that, you know, uh, listed some of those new things, like um, we could see more segmental duplications that more of the human genome is duplicated than previously thought. Um, we could see interesting epigenetic patterns, like there's a methylation dip in the middle of the, cent in the, middle of the centromere, which looks like it's the, where the kinetic core attachment happens. Um, so again, that's interesting biology. Um, and you could look at, you know, that, uh, what the centromeres look like on all the chromosomes uh, for the first time, kind of the full actual uh, context of the sequences there. Um, and so we think, you know, the diploid T2T will enable new biology as well. So for the first time, this is um, the centromere uh, on one chromosome of this uh, assembly that we have. And so just to walk you through the picture, because it's a little complicated. Um, the centromeres are composed of these higher order arrays. So there's a, a repeated sequence that's organized into uh, common structures. And there's three versions of this higher order repeat array that occur in chromosome 19 in humans. Um, and so, you know, there's one version of it here, another version of it here, and a, and a third, ver and a third a higher order repeat array here. And they're all different sizes. What this plot down here is showing is the similarity of any two points of the centromere. Um, so the diagonal, you know, is obviously 100% would be a, com a completely self-similar, but what this is saying is this is a similarity between position at two megabases here to position four megabases here would be over here, right? So you can see that this whole array, which is this one uh, higher order repeat, is extremely similar to itself, um, as is, you know, the other array over here. So the arrays have a lot of self-similarity to themselves, less similarity to the other, you know, between the high, different higher order structures. Um, but, and then here you can see what, how these uh, repeats are organized. So, you know, what uh, kind of, you don't need to pay attention to exactly what the colors mean, but just you can see that this is pretty homogeneously using the similar uh, sequence structure. Um, but when you look at the same chromosome in the same human, but the other internally inherited from the father now, 
Um, you can see, yeah, it still has the same higher level organization. It has three of these higher order arrays, but the sizes of each one are very different uh, compared to the maternally inherited one. And interestingly, even the way it's coding is different, right? So whereas this one was very uh, homogenized, extremely high similarity to itself, uh, this one shows a lot less similarity and it's using a different sequence pattern um, than uh, the maternal is. So there's quite a bit, actually, we were surprised to see how much variation there is um, in, a, in a human between the two centromeres. When we originally started this project, we thought the centromeres would be the hardest to assemble because we thought there would be, you know, there would be no, no, no way for us to tell apart which part is maternal, which part's paternal, uh, and they would be just near identical and would be a giant mess. Um, but surprisingly, the centromeres actually um, have very large structural variations between them uh, in, this, uh, in this human and in other humans we've looked at so far. Uh, and they're actually some of the easiest to resolve in some of the most dynamic regions, and they have huge variations in size. You can see that you know, there, there's very large differences in sizes here. Um, and so this supports kind of this idea of centromere array haplogroups, that they're, the centromeres kind of travel as one unit. They're not recombining within a centromere. Um, and so you're inheriting these like, large structures from your parents, and whatever they inherited, you get that. They don't recombine in the child, so you preserve um, kind of that structure uh, longer term. Um, there are also some interesting things we can see from the assembly graphs um, that is going to be interesting to replicate in other humans. Um, so this is a region that comes from the, near the RDNA, so the RDNA big tangle would be down here somewhere. Uh, but the interesting thing to see here is that there's this blue, part in blue, so all things here are blue, so this is for coming from the father. Um, but what you can see is by the coverage that this looks like there's two pretty much identical um, copies of the chromosome in the father, uh, or inherited from the father, uh, or uh, in this child, right? Um, so what this, this, we know this is two different chromosomes uh, because this, this is paternally, right? It's not like this is a maternal-paternal uh, sequence. And there must have been some event, either it happened in the father or it happened in the child where a paternally inherited chromosome duplicated itself. We think this is because of repair. Uh, where there was a break, uh, and we and when it was repaired, instead of taking, you know, so we have, let's say we have the acrocenter chromosomes 13, 14, 15, 21, 22. There was a break on chromosome 22, and it got repaired with chromosome 13. So there was essentially a conversion where we threw out chromosome 22, uh, either in the father or in the child. We don't know exactly when, uh, and we ended up with two copies of this. Um, so kind of we're seeing that there's conversion in the acrocentrics where we can replace whole uh, set, the whole bit of the chromosome after the RDNA with another chromosome, um, which may help explain why they're so homogenous and why they're so similar uh, between each other in humans because this kind of process happening randomly over time will homogenize, serve to homogenize them um, in the population. And so uh, it's very interesting to see this. This is obviously just one human that we've seen this in, but we want to look at uh, others, we, we have some preliminary evidence that this does seem to happen. We see evidence that what is my chromosome 13 may be your chromosome 21, uh, and that there's actually you know, conversion going on between these chromosomes, that they may be swapping uh, within, human, within humans uh, actively and uh, keeping them homogenized, but also potentially affecting um, you know, uh, our DNA uh, expression and, and other factors. So this will be interesting to study on more humans. Um, so I want to finish because, you know, the conference is kind of machine learning focused. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, machine learning applications here. Uh, obviously, all the sequencing tools that I talk, you know, like PacBio and Anaport, they rely on machine learning to output the sequences, right? That's how you convert those squiggles into base pairs. Um, but building on that, can we learn uh, the sequencer error patterns that they produce, um, right? We do very simple things like we do homopolymer compression but who says that that's the best thing? Maybe you can do other compression. Maybe you can do some other transformation of the sequences that machine learning can suggest. Um, and you know, uh, we could also learn common error motifs and correct them potentially better as well. Um, I showed you some pictures of you know, what humans can do when we look at the graphs and learn to simplify them. And we kind of code these into our pipeline because we looked at it in one human and we learned things and we uh, automated a bunch of resolutions. Uh, based on manual inspection, right? And um, there's been some early work, but I think machine learning has a, a big role here where we can learn essentially safe graph simplifications that 
rather than having to have an expert look at this graph and figure out this is safe, this is not safe to do. The machine learning can suggest and learn the safe kind of transformations that we may not realize ourselves. Um, but I also leave a note of caution um, that you know, this is a very, we usually have very limited training sets. Um, and so we're fitting often leads to artifacts and new genomes. Um, my joke, which I don't know if it's actually true, but my joke is that I would be curious because the nanopore is so heavily trained on human and E. coli, if I feed it noise, is it gonna give me back a human, right? Um, and we've, you know, we've seen this in real time as they change their, their models and they change their base color, we get new and weird artifacts. So uh, in one example uh, for PacBio, they're using uh, Google Deep Consensus to call, to improve their data, and one version of it just completely erased the telomere because it didn't seem high quality enough, so they threw it out as low quality sequence. And so you end up with these weird artifacts where you see weird structure that doesn't match your model, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It might just be something you've never seen before when you sequence some, you know, sure, humans are, uh, are relatively uniform, but when we go out and sequence some random bacteria, some random organism like, uh, you know, amphibians, plants, things that we've never seen before in our models, are we gonna just mess them up and make them humanize them or just completely mess them up and throw them out as noise, right? Um, so to finish with, you know, uh, I showed you CHM13, which is the one we published this year, is done. Uh, HDO2 is also available. Uh, it's in the process of being validated. Uh, we wanna make this together with the Genome on a Bottle Consortium and the HPRC Consortium, uh, the gold standard genome, so we can finally have you know, a truth set, both for sequencing, but also for variant calling for the entire genome, not just for the 90% that we had uh, from the previous reference. Um, the Pan Genome Reference Consortium is generating hundreds of these human haplotypes that are extremely high quality. Um, we're planning to run all these uh, through our pipeline with Verco and improve them even further. Um, and, you know, complete genomes are gonna be the norm. We, we've shown we can do this at least on two different humans. Um, there's lots of ongoing pro projects, too many to even keep track of, I feel like, uh, that this is gonna become the standard. Um, and one thing I'll end on is all assemblies are wrong, but some assemblies are useful. Um, so don't forget that whenever you have a genome assembly, it's important to also validate it and make sure that it's correct and accurate. And so um, with that, I'll take any questions and thank uh, the T2T consortium. Thank you, very, very interesting. Um, you indicated that there are regions through which HiPi sequencing won't read and create a gap. Yep. What data do you, in, do you insert to know that, that that's actually a, f a failure of sequencing rather than the actual gap in the genome? Uh, well, so the, there's ONT data, um, which supports that. Um, and then we can also see once we constructed the Illumina data lines there as well and supports that their sequence there. Um, it's all very specific to GA, so if you compress homopolymer, so it's not actually GA, but it's GGGAA, GGGGA repeats that seems to cause problems. Uh, this may be because it's forming some kind of secondary structure that causes problems with polymerase, uh, causes polymerase to get stuck, um, and so it, it doesn't ever get through. Um, yeah, we see, we've seen a couple of strange artifacts on human satellites as well where there's one context where HiFi has more coverage uh, and ONT has less coverage, or ONT doesn't sequence, o ONT only sequences the forward strand but not the reverse strand, or at least only base calls the forward strand and not the reverse strand. So there's definitely edge cases where um, we see weird artifacts with the sequencing. Dex. Any, any, uh, anyone? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so my understanding was that <clears throat> the reason you could not use the nanopore technology for everything is because of its uh, inaccuracy. Yep. So at what point would there, would the accuracy of that, or do you foresee using both indefinitely? Yes, I mean, the point is now. Um, we, we have some of the T2T projects I mentioned are actually using only ONT data. Um, they have this new mode where they read both the forward strand and the reverse strand together, they call duplex. And the accuracy of that is comparable to HiFi. Um, the problem with that is currently the throughput is very low. Um, so the conversion is not uh, very high. So 
to get like 30x coverage of you know something like a corn genome, you'd need to burn uh, like 30 cells, which is a lot. You know, for you, you'd need to like run an entire instrument for a human. Um, but they're improving it uh, very quickly, so there is definitely potential. I think you know, um, in, in a year or two, that that, that ONT only can be used for that. But we're definitely seeing good early results with that. Can I ask kind of a basic question on the map that you showed of the the diploid? Mm -hmm. genome where the red and the blue, the maternal and paternal, where they yeah. coalesce and separate. Can you just explain what that means? Yes, I mean, that's just kind of, um, let's see, you mean, well, that one works too, but this part, right? Yeah, so I mean, essentially this is showing you the phased parts of the genome. So um, when there's a, when they coalesce, that's a region that's homozygous, that means you, you inherited the same thing from the mom and the dad. Um, and so it's 100% identical, so we can't separate it because all the sequence says that it's identical, right? And so it has twice as many reads as everywhere else, and so we see it as a, as a collapse. Um, and then the other regions where we saw differences in the HiFi graph, because we're, it's a very high resolution map, right? We can see that there's like single bases different between the maternally inherited, paternally inherited um, sequence, we separate them out. Uh, and then we can link those, these, those together with ONT data to get really long blocks where we know this is maternal, this is maternal specific, this is paternal specific. So uh, all those red and blue bits are where we could see differences, enough differences to keep those nodes separate. So where do you see the opportunity for commercialization for industries in this particular technology? Or, or you see like in future, like where it could be commercialized, which are the points or technologies that yeah, so I mean, I, I think one of the first probably places is just using a better reference uh, for clinical diagnosis, clinical analysis, right? So because a lot of, um, a lot of commercial uh, clinical assays use the, the previous reference and are kind of skipping parts of the genome. And so the first commercial company that can integrate it and show that they get useful clinical uh, actionable variants uh, will have a... Um, uh, leg up on the rest, right? So that's the, kind of the simple first step. But I think longer term, um, I expect that it will become more routine that you can see, get your sequencing not just once but multiple times throughout your life because we know that the human, your genome is not constant in all your cells and it changes over time. Um, and so I expect, you know, in, in 10 years' time, it won't be that strange for you to have your genome sequenced as part of your standard yearly health, plan, like health checkup. Um, and, and have it on file and see any changes that are happening um, and to, for early detection of cancer and things like this, right? And also, it'll be interesting, you know, in the early, we, we don't have a great understanding, I think, of exactly what happens of the somatic variation. So one of the early things we're looking at, you know, we're also starting to look at somatic variation within the body. So I think that potentially will open uh, commercialization in the future as well, because if there's something there that's actionable. Okay, so I have two questions. Uh, first of all, so now we have the uh, data. Now we have the uh, assembly or the uh, sequence of the human right. diploid cells or chromosomes. So is there any study already done like uh, with the sequence where uh, we compared like maybe uh, the same human, so the 13 with the 21 of the same human, and like uh, all the uh, 1 till 23, and like we uh, tried to like combine all the sequences and feels like how much there is like the matchings between one and another chromosome sets or the sequences? Yeah, that, I mean, that's been done. That was done with the first, um, the, the kind of uh, haploid version um, that we did. Um, that one of the companion papers looked specifically at the segmental duplications and how much is shared between the chromosomes, and a lot is the answer. Uh, but it also varies, depends on what you define as a repeat, it, you know, how much, I, how long, what, what similarity, right? Because depending on those cutoffs, you're gonna mark more or less of the genome as the same. Um, I can tell you that the acrocentric uh, chromosomes that contain the RDNA are extremely similar to each other. I think any random 10 kilobase window you pick on one of those is 95 or higher percent identity to, actually 99% or higher to, to one of the other uh, four of those, those chromosomes. Um, and they're also a source or a set of uh, repeats going everywhere else in the genome. So they, they, they tend to uh, come out of those chromosomes and go onto other chromosomes as well. 
Um, so there's actually no new, completely new sequence on those uh, rDNA containing chromosomes, which were missing in the reference before completely. Um, they were all in the reference somewhere else at some similarity, but you know, we, we didn't see them as coming from that rDNA chromo holding chromosomes. Um, okay. So, but, you know, but yes, there, there have been more complete maps of what the human kind of repeat landscape looks like, yeah. Okay, great. And the second one's like, um, if we go a little bit uh, back in the slides, mm -hmm. so there was like a um, graph uh, where like, um, it was searching for the best path a uh, little early. Uh, probably this yeah. one, right? Yeah. Yeah, like um, walking through the simple path. So it's yeah. uh, searching for the best path to like kind of match through all of those and like which can be the best possibility. You mean on this side or on this side? Uh, the walking... Uh, this one? Sim no, first one. The, walking the, first one, the first one is just, it's, it's a Hamiltonian path because you, if you constrain that you have to use every node once, um, there's only one way to walk that graph. So that one is kind of defined by the graph structure. Um, on these, yes, what we, what, you know, what we did when we were doing this manually was we uh, try to make all the possible versions of this and, and then look at how the ONT data supports it and decide which one is better supported. And the yeah, automated so one does essentially that, yeah. So now my question is like, um, so if we are searching for the uh, best simple path to right. go through it, so why don't we like uh, send it like a uh, same time to all of the path, like uh, if those are the nodes, right. so um, kind of send send the information through all of them like uh, at the same time, maybe it will like uh, more time accurate or like uh, it will work through it more. Well, I mean, that's essentially what we're doing. We send, you know, we, we do the, the ONT reads walk it independently, all of them, and we see which way they walk. So that, that's the automated algorithm, right? Is that it sends all the ONT data at the same time through the path independently, and then we see how well they support if there's a winner, uh, clearly that they're all voting for. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah, this is why the manual analysis failed because, you know, it's hard to make sure you get everything, like I said, because humans aren't very good at doing those kind of repetitive tasks, right? Any, any additional questions? I have a, I have a follow-up, um, Sergey. So for Virco, mm -hmm. you had, um, you just had described you walk. What's preventing it from finishing those n nine unplaced? Um, usually they are, um, I mean, there, there's, some are algorithmic challenges where we're still improving the things it can handle. Um, sometimes it's just because, you know, in, in um, there's, too, there's too high of a similarity. Um, like in, in like this example, right, the, the nodes are too similar for us to have agreement between the ONT reads and the ONT reads are still too noisy. And so because we can't decide which way they best align and they all kind of randomly break um, we, we can't make a decision, right? So uh, improving ONT read lengths or improving ONT accuracy would help in both of those cases. Okay, and then maybe as a, um, a follow-up, a little backing up just for Nate. I like to think about names of software tools. Where, mm -hmm. did, where did Canoe come from? Uh, Canoe, uh, well, you were there. Uh, it was originally CA3G, but we thought that was, well, first people didn't like third generation because that's, you know, what's second generation, what's third. Um, but also, you know, we, it was kind of cumbersome, so we were trying to think of something easy to say, uh, which we came up with uh, canoe, which is a ship theme, I guess, that we had at the time, and we changed the spelling because we thought that non-English speakers would not know how to spell canoe, like, because it's kind of a weird word. Um, so we just simplified it, and it also was nice because it says, you know, it says, can you, so like, can you assemble, can you? And, uh, and just to be clear, like the CA, what does that stand So you? That was Solar Assembler originally. So that's the first thing you worked on. Yep. And then, okay. So. Yeah. And then Virco still, you know, Virco is still using their code. So if you, um, if you think your bioinformatics tools are long lasting, so there are still bits of canoe that this is using that were written for the original Human Genome Project at Solera that we're still using that still work. And they're, you know, at this point, 25 years old and still like, you know, they still work great on all this data that they couldn't have imagined at that time, right? So, yeah. Okay. Any, any final questions? And Virco is oh. a phishing net. So because we, our postdoc we developed it primarily was Finnish, so we went with a Finnish name theme. Hello. I'm a very big follower of your talks, and uh, I'm very fortunate to be attending one of yours. 
Uh, my question is homopolymer compression and microsatellite compression. Mm -hmm. uh, during that process, are we losing any, uh, any important data? And also down the line, how is it impacting the size of the entire genome if we do uh, compression at several points right. in the genome? Yeah, so I'll answer the second part first because it's easier. For human, it's about 1.5 fold smaller. Um, so usually the things that we're looking at in the graph space, which is compressed, um, we don't, we, the microsatellite compression is only done for the uh, initial construction. We uncompress it immediately. Um, the homopolymer compression is only uh, undone at the very, very end here. Okay. Um, so it's about one and a half times uh, compressed. Um, the answer to the, to the first part is yes. Uh, we are throwing away important information, and there are regions of the genome where the only variation is. Um, so if there's regions of the genome where within the length of a PEC by read, about 20 kilobases, the only variation is, say, like the number of CAs, right? We'll collapse that and we'll end up not properly separating it out. And so one of the places where that seems to happen in the human genome is a chromosome X, uh, which is very homozygous compared to other chromosomes, um, probably because it can't recombine in, in males. Um, and so, yes, we, we are losing information. We try to put some of that back. There's, there's ways in Verco where it will look at the, even though it's compressing things, it will look at the distribution of the counts um, of the CAs that are compressed, and if they're different enough, like if there's five versus 10. Like if there's five and six, we just can't do anything because that's just within the noise spectrum. Um, but if there's enough difference, it will still separate them out after the fact, even though it had collapsed them initially. So we do try to put that information back. But yes, there are definitely parts of the genome where homopolymer counts uh, and, and definitely microsatellite uh, counts are the only thing that define the difference between the haplotypes and the repeats. Okay, thank you. It's the same question when we are doing correction. Mm -hmm. It skips some motifs. Does it also cause losing some information? Um, the main motif we skip correction in correction is the microsatellites, and no, because we compress, that's why we can, part of why we compress it afterwards, um, because it's just too hard to correct those because alignments are very noisy there. Um, and so, but yes, I think you know we could do better correction. Uh, I think there are ways to improve the correction, and it's also. Currently, it's extremely um, conservative because we don't want to lose any true variants. So um, when you have very high coverage, we, like in regions like the RDNA, I think we undercorrect and we end up making the graph more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, and so often what we do when we are manually resolving it, we go back and do it, um, do the correction more stringent, like less stringently, um, and then build the graphs again and, and use that as a resolution. But I think, yeah, automating that uh, there's room for improvement there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I think okay. we got oh, time yeah. for one more question, I think. We'll just... <laughs> All right. Uh, my question is more like a three-part question. Mm -hmm. So um, as a pharmacist, I think I'm more concerned about the application of this, um, let's say the completion of this study in mm -hmm. pharmacogenomics. So what effect does it have on like where we are currently in pharmacogenomics? That is one. Mm -hmm. Then the second one is, um, you know, um, I'm looking at the cost implication, you know, because I remember when you were mentioning its application in our current healthcare where you could right. just walk into a hospital and they already yeah. have, you know, your complete genome sequence and all that. So I'm looking at how is that going to affect the cost of healthcare, basically, right. it, you know, and um, I think the last one is um, on the ethical side of it, you know, um, has there been any study or any thoughts towards um, its application and the ethics behind applying this, you know, on the patient's right. part and all that, because, you know, you still have to seek the patient's, um, how do I put it now, authority, basically, right. to get the... Yeah, and I, and I mean, there's, they're kind of, so I'll do it backwards, too. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely, you know, there's multiple levels of, of ethical concerns. You know, one of them is that, the, and this is a big, uh, a big part of the HPRC, is making sure that we sample uh, the human diversity properly. Um, because HGO2, so CHM13 was uh, European ancestry. HGO2 is Ashkenazi Jewish, uh, again, mostly European ancestry. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of European genomes around. Um, and we want to make sure that we have diversity. So we have, with a collaboration with HPRC, a panel of 10 diverse genomes that, we're, that are next in line, essentially, for this kind of process to so make sure that we capture uh, the variation present that's outside of the Europeans, because obviously those aren't a great representative of all humans. Um, but there's, you know, there's 
uh, bigger implications than just getting the data because those communities, rightly so, have mistrust of the, of the science, uh, scientists and genomics because they've been burned in the past um, by unethical practices. And so building the outreach and the trust with those communities um, is one thing that genomics has to do and the HPRC is trying to, to do that. Uh, but I think it'll take time. Uh, but it's important to do that because we don't want to end up with um, you know, non-representative uh, sampling. And also, we want to be careful when there, there's a lot of projects that are doing kind of um, the national genome, right? So let's say we're doing like the core na nation genome. Um, and we have to be careful that what we define as the core in genome uh, is inclusive enough and doesn't make anyone feel like they don't belong in the country, right? If I say like, you're not core enough to be like part of our nation, right? And, and that can lead to discrimination. Um, and so there's a lot of ethics involved, I think. And luckily, NHGRI has always been funding a lot of that work from the initial human genome projects. I think we'll get there, but it's going to take a lot of hard work, um, and, it's, and it's going to be slow. Um, and you know, the, there's also the need for proper communication to the patient, right? Once we, if we actually have this in a clinical setting, making sure that we can properly explain it to the person, properly consent them, uh, is, a, is another big thing. And I think that is going to come together working with clinicians, working with uh, um, genetic counselors to figure out how we best communicate this. Because right now, you know, I know from experience from newborn uh, genetic screening that, you know, the, the doctors aren't quite equipped to explain the genomics, uh, right? And so, yeah, that's going to be a, a learning curve, I think, as well. Um, on the pharmacogenomic side, I'll, I'll make that part shorter because I'm not an expert, so I can't fully comment on it, but I can tell you that, you know, there are a lot of medically relevant genes, um, and there was a recent study from the Genome Metabolic Consortium looking that you get much better results using CHM13 uh, for looking at the variants in these clinically uh, medically relevant genes with our reference than with the previous reference. So we're fixing kind of the regions where there were, you know, there's multi-copy genes. A lot of these medically relevant genes are multi-copy or complicated. Um, and we better represent all the copies so you can actually accurately call variations in them, whereas before you couldn't see them. So I think there's definitely going to be applications uh, in the pharmacogenomics from that um, very, you know, very soon. All right, thank you. And I'll just add for the panel discussion we have coming up, we have um, uh, one, another guest, Dr. Fritz Zelacek, who's here, who can also have some, some thoughts on that. But let's go ahead and thank our speaker, our keynote speaker, for a fabulous talk.